The development, Mr. Secretary Rory Stewart. Madam Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will update the House on the campaign against Daesh, which recently controlled a third of Iraq and Syria, an area the size of the United Kingdom, and has now lost its final piece of territory in Baghouz in Syria. Their sudden rise and fall, morally troubling, profoundly threatening, and almost unprecedented, carries deep lessons and warnings for Britain and, indeed, the nations of the world. As recently as 2003, the borders of Syria and Iraq were stable. Secular Arab nationalism appeared to have triumphed over the older forces of tribe and religion. Different religious communities, Yazidi, Shabak, Kakai, Christian and Sunni, continued to live alongside each other as they had for more than a millennium. Iraqis and Syrians had better incomes, education, health systems and infrastructures than most citizens of the developing world. By 2014, all of this had changed, partly because of the Iraq War, partly because of the Arab Spring in Syria, but in great part due to the astonishing rise of Daesh. Just three years after the withdrawal of the coalition in 2011, A movement initially founded by a tattooed, drug-taking video store assistant from Jordan had, following his death, captured Raqqa, Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul and Palmyra and torn off a third of the territory of Syria and Iraq, creating an independent Islamic state of almost 8 million people. This was a state with endemic poverty, struggling public services, defined not just by suicide bombs, but also by a vicious campaign against religious minorities. Well-established borders between these nations were obliterated. A few hundred men routed three divisions of the Iraqi army. Secular nationalism was swept aside by a bizarre religious ideology. And no one in 2005, and very few in 2010, would have predicted the success of that movement. There were, of course, many reasons to fear an insurgency in northeast Syria or in Iraq. People felt little loyalty towards the lamentable governments in Baghdad or Damascus, with their anti-Sunni discrimination, corruption and poor provision of services. But there was initially very little reason to believe that people would have supported Daesh rather than other insurgency groups. Indeed, Daesh's imposition of early medieval social codes, its horrifying videos of slaughter of fellow Arabs, seemed to most Iraqis and Syrians profoundly irrational, culturally inappropriate, and deeply unappealing. And their military tactics seemed almost insane. They deliberately picked fights not only with the Syrian and Iraqi regimes, but also with Jabhat al-Nusra, with the Free Syrian Army, with the Shia communities as a whole, with the Iranian Quds forces, and with the Kurds, who initially tried to stay out of the fight. And they finished 2014 by mounting an almost suicidal attack in Kobani in the face of over 600 US airstrikes, losing many thousands of fighters and gaining almost no ground. But all of this, which should have been Daesh's undoing, seemed at times simply to encourage tens of thousands of foreign fighters to join them, coming not only from very poor countries, but also from some of the wealthiest countries in the world, from the social democracies of Scandinavia, as much as from monarchies, military states, authoritarian regimes and liberal democracies. Part of the success of Daesh was notoriously connected to social media. It was the first terrorist movement that really flourished on short, often homemade video clips, on Twitter rants, and Facebook posts from the front line. It grew far more quickly and survived far longer than any diplomat, politician or expert analyst predicted. And the options that seemed available to defeat this kind of movement in 2008 were no longer available in 2014. Eight years earlier, or in that case six years earlier, there had been a full-spectrum international counterinsurgency campaign relying on overwhelming force and huge investments in economic development with 100,000 coalition troops 
eight years of coalition training packages and almost $100 billion a year of U.S. expenditure. But that approach ultimately failed to create stability in Iraq, and there was no appetite to repeat it again in 2016. The U.S. and its allies did not want to deploy troops on the ground in Syria, and very few near the front lines in Iraq, and no one was advocating nation-building in the middle of another war. Instead, the counterattack on Daesh in Mosul was led by an Iraqi government. And initially, this didn't seem very promising. That government appeared to lack the capacity or the will to restore even the most basic services to communities in Fallujah or Ramadi. They were backed by unreliable Sunni tribal militias or by Iranian-supported Shia popular mobilization forces who alienated and terrified the local populations. Kurdish Iraqi forces also seemed unwilling to fight Daesh in Mosul. The coalition provided training to Iraqi forces, but on a much smaller scale than during the surge. And Daesh had laid mines throughout the urban areas and were fighting for every inch of ground. It is remarkable, therefore, that Daesh was ultimately defeated. This was in large part due, on the Syrian side of the border, to the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, and on the Iraqi side of the border to the counter-terrorism force, which at times was enduring casualty rates of almost 40% of its combatants. Iraqi forces regrouped, retook Fallujah, Ramadi, and Mosul by early 2017, and the forces in Syria had retaken Raqqa and Deir ez by 2018. Now, whereas during the surge, the UK and its allies had been intimately involved in trying to reshape the Iraqi government and security on the ground, our recent involvement has been less extensive. And rather than nation-building, it has focused since 2014 on some £350 million in humanitarian aid in Iraq to provide health care, food and shelter. We've provided almost a £1 billion in Syria over the last four years, including £40 million in aid to northeast Syria in 2018, going towards mine clearance, immunisation of children, clean water, food and shelter. This assistance continues. In Syria alone, there are 1.65 million people in need, with over a half a million forced to flee their homes. Unexploded munitions and mines remain a major issue. And in Iraq, some 4 million people are returning home, having been forced out. Nevertheless, this aid is on a much smaller scale than was provided by civilian officials from 2003 to 2011. Our embassy and associated staff are much smaller. There are no longer coalition civilian outposts in every province. And the coalition, and indeed the Iraqi government, are a very long way from being able to take on the task of reconstructing the shattered remnants of Mosul. So what lessons can we draw from all of this? First, that the hundreds of billions of dollars and the hundreds of thousands of troops committed by the coalition in Iraq from 2003, and more intensely from 2008, were not ultimately sufficient to create a stable civil service, a flourishing and sustainable economy, strong institutions, security, or indeed any of the ingredients of a well-functioning state. And this suggests that even the best resourced foreign intervention may not actually be able to reconstruct a nation in the context of an insurgency. Second, that local forces with a light foreign support may be able to achieve far more than people anticipated. Paradoxically, the Iraqi operations may have been effective not despite the lack of support from the West, but because of the lack of support from the West. In other words, Madam Deputy Speaker, operating with much less foreign assistance may have given the Iraqi and Syrian forces far more legitimacy, flexibility, control and sense of responsibility. Third, the sudden rise and sudden fall of Daesh illustrates the extreme fragility of many contemporary societies. The entire political economic context was and remains so fluid, so open to exploitation, with so little deep institutional loyalty or resistance, that it was terrifyingly easy for an insurgency group to establish themselves on both sides of the border. They may have lost their territory for now, but the underlying conditions remain and could allow insurgents to establish themselves again. And even without holding territory, Daesh remains a significant terrorist threat. And finally, in a context so inherently unpredictable 
and unexpected, Britain and its allies needs to stand in a state of grace, preparing for the unexpected. We need to keep a close eye on countries which might seem temporarily at peace, continue to invest in the development of countries which might seem no longer to need development, continue to deepen our knowledge of countries which may not seem a priority today, retaining our linguistic expertise and, above all, nurturing our relationships with people in those countries and with potential coalition partners such as the US and France and, in a different context, Germany. Whether in northeast Nigeria, in Somalia or Libya, in Afghanistan or Mali, the key to our response will never be the amount of money we invest or the number of troops we deploy, but the depth of our understanding, the care and subtlety with which we respond, our ability to deploy development, defence and intelligence and economic levers, diplomacy and a dozen other tools rapidly and precisely, not overruling other governments, but supporting them in the right way at the right time with prudence and economy, which is why we must close this Daesh statement with deep respect to the courage of our military forces, to the skill of our diplomats and the generosity of our development programs, but above all, with deep respect for the people of Syria and Iraq who were at the heart of this fight, who gave their lives, who led this response, and provide us with an example of how we can act as partners with energy, but above all with humility. I commend this statement to the House. Dan Carter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his statement. And whilst this update is welcome, can I point out that in the 365 days since the 4th of July last year, this is only the second statement given in the House, despite the Government promising Parliament quarterly reports to keep the House updated. Madam Deputy Speaker, we welcome the destruction of Daesh, Daesh's final enclaves in Syria. We know that Daesh is a threat to us all, and they must be defeated wherever they emerge. And news reports just today reveal another mass grave uncovered in Raqqa. 200 corpses found, it's feared more will follow. The dead, thought to be victims of Daesh, included bodies found in orange jumpsuits, the kind typically worn by their hostages. And let me pay tribute to UK forces who've put their lives on the line, and also show gratitude, as the Secretary of State did, to those Kurdish forces who have taken huge risks in leading the fight against Daesh. And will he now reassure the House and the, Kurdish and the Kurdish community that it will not be abandoned or left vulnerable to attacks by Syria or Turkey? And he mentions Yazidis, Christians, Shias and Sunnis in his statement. So can he tell us what is he doing to support the protection of all communities in the region? and on the question of on the ongoing role of our forces in the region. The 2015 motion that set down the terms for our engagement in Syria to eradicate Daesh's safe haven in Syria and Iraq was written in such a way to avoid an ongoing military conflict in the region. Can he now set out the purpose of our forces in the region, given that their original purpose of defeating Daesh's safe haven has been achieved? And does he, he believe the original mandate has now expired and therefore a, new, a renewed mandate for military action and clarity on the role of special forces is required for continued UK engagement in the region? And let me say a few words on the ongoing conflict in Syria. There remain serious concerns for civilians in Idlib. What steps is he taking to ensure that there are safe corridors for civilians to leave given the UN has warned that up to 700,000 people could flee Idlib as refugees. And given dozens of health facilities have been damaged and destroyed in recent months, leading to more than half a million civilians being unable to access vital medical care, what steps is the government taking to encourage parties <coughs> to the conflict to adhere to international humanitarian law and protect civilians? Madam Deputy Speaker, last month I was lucky enough to meet a delegation from the Syrian women's political movement. Yeah, yeah. They spoke about their experiences of being denied their rights to employment, education and medical care. 
and facing sexual and gender-based violence and exploitation. And they called for increased women's representation in peace negotiations and decision-making positions. Will the Secretary of State take today's opportunity to respond to their calls? And on Iraq, does he share the growing international concern about arbitrary, draconian and legally unsound way in which the Iraqi authorities are conducting trials of alleged jihadist collaborators and the resentment caused amongst the, amongst the Sunni community in Iraq? What discussions are taking place regarding the huge numbers of detained suspected Daesh fighters? In total, more than 55,000 suspected Daesh fighters and their families have been detained in Syria and Iraq. Most of them are citizens of these two countries, but overall they come from 50 countries or more. And more than 11,000 of the relatives are being held in the Al Hoy camp in northern, northeastern Syria. And Michelle Bachelet, the UN Human Rights Chief, has said that relatives of suspected fighters should be taken back to their country of origin. Does the Secretary of State agree with her calls? And finally, I'd like to raise the issue of Daesh's ongoing influence beyond the physical ba battlefield. He's spoken today about Daesh's physical territory, but their influence online is an ongoing threat and deeply worrying. So what is the government doing to work with our allies to ensure that action is taken by social media companies so that Daesh cannot find new safe havens online to spread its hatred. Thank you very much. Secretary of State. I'd like to thank the Shadow Secretary of State for his statement. A um, no, number of issues that were touched on there, Madam Deputy Speaker, stretching from the Kurdish community to Daesh online, and I'll try to deal with them one after another. Um, the, the first thing, which I think is at the heart of the answers to all these questions, is that the only real way in which we are going to be able to resolve problems is through a proper political settlement. So many of these issues, which the Shadow Secretary of State has ri raised, whether it's the minority rights of Yazidis and Christians, or whether it is the relationship between Kurds and Syria, or Kurds in Iraq with their national governments have to be resolved through a political settlement. It's very easy to stand at the dispatch box and try to talk about an inclusive political settlement. It is unbelievably difficult to achieve, particularly after eight years of war, deep resentments, massive militarization of societies. We see the challenges all the way from Somalia to Yemen. It's going to be just as difficult on the Syria-Iraqi border, but ultimately that is the only way of resolving these issues, and the more support we can provide for mediators to try to come up with those political solutions, the better off we all will be. There was a technical and important question around the purpose of British forces. So clearly the reason that we have forces on the ground is there was a request by the Iraqi government for self-defence against Daesh and Syria. And the justification for our continuing presence is to do with the continuing threat that Daesh poses as a terrorist organisation, but not as a territorial holding organisation. But it is worth reassuring the House that the nature of our presence is relatively limited. So we're talking about airstrikes, many of them actually not conducted, the planes not being based in the Middle East itself, and we're talking about British troops who are predominantly involved in training operations and counter-IED training and first aid training, some of them based in the Kurdish regions, some of them based in Iraqi bases. But this is not the type of operation, and we're talking there about a few hundred people. This is not the type of operation that we were talking about in Iraq or Afghanistan. Therefore, I don't think it's necessary to have a whole new mandate. I do, however, share the frustration of the Shadow Secretary of State uh, that an issue as important as this remains so poorly attended in the House of Commons, and I hope uh, that our sense of seriousness as a nation means that the next time such a statement happens, people engage more uh, in the debate. Idlib is a source of huge concern. DFID has put £80 million into humanitarian support in Idlib, but it remains true that the populations in Idlib are under a ferocious and brutal attack from the Syrian government. It remains very difficult to access people within Idlib, and we continue through every mechanism to call both on the Syrian government and through their supporters, which include their supporters from Russia, to exercise restraint in this. But actually, our options have been very limited, and we need to do so in a way that doesn't repeat the mistakes that were made in the past of laying down red lines that we're not able to maintain.
or raising the hopes of communities in ways that we aren't able to vindicate or justify. Which brings me to the question of resettlement in Iraq, the 55,000 suspected Daesh fighters, uh, their families, and social media. All of this is leading up to a much bigger issue. So there are clearly some legal issues raised, there are consular issues raised, there are human rights issues raised, but at the heart of all of this has to be the question of Daesh Mark II. In other words, the question of how we prevent all the same conditions, all the same resentments, all the same abuses, all the same lack of public services and corruption, which led to the emergence of Daesh in its first form back in 2004-05, in its new form in 2011-12, re-emerging again. And that means that we have to work with the Iraqi government and indeed with those areas of Syria controlled by the SDF to ensure that people's rights are respected, that reconstruction money is going in, and above all, that Sunni Arabs feel they have a stake in a political settlement, where at the moment they feel deeply excluded often, both by the regimes, by the ethnicity of those regimes, and by the sectarian allegiances of those regimes. Sir Michael Palin. Recognising on that last point the considerable caution he's expressed about the future of Iraq, can he say what more can be done to help promote political reconciliation in those provinces of Anbar and Nineveh and to encourage economic reforms that will enable all the provinces of Iraq to benefit from the stability that our forces have done so much to secure? Secretary of State. Well, th this is, of course, of course, an issue that the Right Honourable Member uh, knows very, very well indeed. Uh, in, in essence, the only way that we can begin to bring some kind of life and some kind of hope back to areas like Anbar and Nineveh is by making sure that we have the right combination of economic development, governance and security, which is a pompous way of saying we need to start fixing houses in Fallujah, Ramadi and Mosul. That means clearing mines out of the way. That means actually physically getting buildings up. This has to be led by the Iraqi government. There is more that we can do in terms of tax incentives, in terms of training, in terms of support, in terms of infrastructure. But that, too, comes to the next situation, which is, of course, security. They still remain dangerous areas. There still is a rural insurgency continuing. And the way in which that security is addressed, the identity of the Iraqi forces that we bring in, their sectarian allegiances will be very important in regaining the trust of the population. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have to have the right kind of devolution down to the local levels so that people feel that the leadership in Mosul and Ramadi or Fallujah genuinely reflects them, reflects them democratically, reflects their identities, reflects a sense of hope, so that those three elements of security, governance and economic development can begin to produce a sense of hope. Martin Doherty Hughes. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's nice to see you in the chair as always. Um, can I first of all say, as someone whose brother served in Iraq, that I'm conscious of the sacrifice laid by members of the armed forces uh, over the long period of time in which they have been there. I may not necessarily agree in the original direction of travel, uh, but nevertheless the commitment of members of the armed forces is keenly felt by those of us who have family in the armed forces and also on these benches. There is not much, I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I can disagree with in terms of both the Minister, Secretary of State and also the official opposition, but I, I do uh, wish to maybe raise some issues which have not yet been spoken about. But before I do, can I say to the Minister and to the House, I think it is the onus is on us here, in, not only in these islands but across Western Europe, to consider our own history in terms of ethnic and religious tension before we ever believe that we could give some kind of panacea to the peoples of Iraq, or as I will also say, Kurdistan. Uh, and I think we should listen, first of all, learn from our own history. The uh, Cabinet, the Secretary of State, raised some serious issues around oppor opportunities for uh, moving forward into reconciliation. And even uh, the official uh, opposition mentioned some of the issues highlighted in some of the camps. And I wish maybe specifically to highlight what was mentioned by Ben Tobin, the New Yorker, back in December last year. He says, shortly after 10 o'clock, three judges in long black robes shuffled into courtroom two, sat at the bench. Shohal Abdul Sahar, a bald, middle-aged man with a thin, jowly face, sat in the centre. There were 21 cases on his docket that day, 16 related to terrorism. He quietly read out a name. Security officer shouted it down the hall, and away they went and got him. Out came a young man named Ahmed. Security officer led him to a wooden cage. Sir, I swear, he said, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have never been to Qara. Sahir was sceptical. I have a written confession here with your thumbprint on it. 
Sir, I swear I gave my thumbprint on a blank paper, Ahmed replied, and I was tortured by the security forces. Evidence, enough evidence, the prosecutor said. I ask for a guilty verdict. The young man wept. His trial had lasted four and a half minutes. I am sure this, the Secretary of State will recognise that some of the issues in relation to reconciliation are compounded by corruption within the existing infrastructure of the Iraqi government, notably corruption in Mosul through uh, the limitation of the impact of international aid because of the mayor of Mosul. Uh, I was also at a meeting yesterday with my honourable friend, right, honourable, the honourable member for Argyll and Butte, talking about uh, Scottish uh, medical professionals trying to get into Mosul as well. Uh, does the Secretary of State also recognise there has already been questioned about the issue of women and children, specifically those women whose husbands divorced them by telephone, uh, and also children whose husbands abdicated responsibility for them after they joined Daesh, and their wives, ex-wives, ex-wives, and, and their children are now being treated not only as second-class citizens, but lower than cattle. Uh, I wonder also if the, cabinet, the, the Secretary of State finally uh, recognised that the dire need for truth and reconciliation in not only Iraq, but to enable breathing space between the government of Iraq and the government of Kurdistan in relation to some of the issues between the border issues specifically, which is allowing a possible Daesh resurgence. Yeah, yeah. Secretary of State. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, th that portrait of a courtroom is, of course, uh, profoundly shocking. And the Honourable Member is absolutely right to say that if you conduct court proceedings in that way, in other words, if people feel that their constitutional rights are not being upheld, that their uh, evidence is being extracted by torture, and that people are being prosecuted, this simply provides a really strong reason for more insurgency, as well as being a, a flagrant abuse. Um, a flagrantly unjust act. The, the challenge for us, Madam Deputy Speaker, is to think what Britain and other countries can actually do about it. So the reality is that we've tended to approach rule of law programmes through focusing on training. So traditionally, a judge like that would have been put through a training course. They might even have been flown to the University of Kansas for a couple of weeks to go on a seminar. There would have been a lot of investment in legal books and in court procedure. The problem, though, is unlikely to be, in that case, simply a case of capacity building. It's much more likely to be a case of the political context. And I think the key thing is trying to communicate through the, well, in the most respectful way we can to a sovereign government, through the Minister's Justice, that in the end, this kind of approach, um, as indeed many Iraqis would acknowledge, is, is self-defeating. So, but working out where we as Britain or France or Germany or indeed the United States or anyone else engaging, how we can actually get involved right down to the level of that courtroom in a decision made by uh, a judge on a bench remains very, very tough there or indeed in a hundred other countries in the world. Um, the issue around the question of divorce and the treatment of women is again uh, a subset of the much bigger issue, which is the ways in which this type of injustice, this type of abuse, is going to continue to fuel resentment going forward into the future. And I look forward, perhaps, to sitting down with the Honourable Member to discuss the issues of the borders at another occasion. Dr Julian Lewis. It's always a pleasure to hear my right honourable friend talking about this subject. Although it's a grim subject, uh, the depth of his knowledge is always enlightening. And I would hope that at some stage we might have a debate rather than just an update statement so that we could engage with him more fully. Uh, could I, therefore, just ask him a couple of points? First, does he accept that ultimately the reason Daesh was defeated was that by seizing and holding territory, they gave up the terrorists' best weapon, the cloak of invisibility. And secondly, can I say that the only thing I found missing from his statement was any reference to that part of Syria that was not fought upon and occupied by the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces. Can he explain to us what percentage of the country is occupied by forces other than the Kurdish-led forces? Is it not the case that a large percentage of the country is occupied by the forces of Assad, 
And does he now accept what the government has denied all along, that if we wanted the insurgency in Syria to be defeated, the logical consequence was going to be, unacceptable though it seems, that Assad was at least in part going to win, given the support of his Russian backers? Well, th- these are two very important challenges by the uh, Distinguished Chairman of the Defence Committee. Taking the second and then moving on to the first. So it's, of course, true that the vast majority now of Syria is in the hands of Bashar al-Assad's regime. And looking back in time, the optimism of the United States and the United Kingdom that Bashar al-Assad uh, would inevitably be defeated and, indeed, the red lines that were created by President Obama and others uh, have not been vindicated in any way at all. In fact, with Russian backing, the Syrian regime has not only retaken uh, the land right the way up to the Euphrates, so the edge of this area, which we're talking about with the SDF, but also, of course, now pushed south to the Jordanian border and is now pushing up to Idlib, having taken Aleppo uh, and the rural areas around Damascus. So, absolutely, of course, the Chairman of the Defence Act Committee is correct uh, in his assessment of that. That doesn't, of course, answer the bigger issue, which is what a government like the United Kingdom or the United States chooses to do with that Syrian regime in the future. And this returns to the kinds of challenges that we faced in dealing, for example, with the Shia community in southern Iraq under the brutality of Saddam Hussein. How on earth do we balance our humanitarian obligations towards people in horrifying conditions with our sense that we don't wish to operate in the territory of a man who, whatever uh, the sequence of his military successes, remains an unbelievably a brutal murderer who is associated clearly with the execution of unarmed prisoners in countless prisons and the deployment of chemical weapons. But So that, that will remain the key issue for this House to consider over the next months and indeed years. The first issue, again, the Chairman of the Defence Secretary is absolutely right. One of the most bizarre, peculiar and ultimately self-defeating parts of Daesh's campaign was its decision to try to hold territory and in particular to try to take on conventional forces. The entire idea of a insurgency or a terrorist organization is supposed to be to drift around like mist, or in fact, to take Chairman Mao's analogy, to to work and feed off the consent of the local population. Daesh did neither of those things. It attempted to hold territory and take on, as I said in Kobani, 600 US airstrikes, and it attempted to alienate the entire population it was attempted to depend on through its very brutal videos and its incredibly horrifying Islamic social codes. So what's extraordinary, in fact, is not that they were ultimately defeated, but that they remained so successful for so long and were able to hold this territory for such an extended period of time. Tom Brake. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On Monday I met the Iraqi ambassador, and it's very clear that the Iraqi authorities are very keen uh, for the UK government, EU countries, the US and Russia to take responsibility Uh, for Daesh fighters and their families who might or might not have been involved in terrorist activities. Uh, Will the UK government do that, take responsibility for those fighters? The the position of the UK government remains that we believe that the vast majority of these people should be more appropriately prosecuted in the countries in which their crimes were committed, which means that these individuals, (coughs) if they were Daesh fighters, were slaughtering Iraqi and Syrian civilians. They were committing their crimes within that territory. And it is perfectly acceptable for them to be prosecuted in their territory, as it indeed would be for the citizen of any country that committed a crime in somebody else's country. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Secretary of State um, for his very thoughtful (coughs) responses. But I'd like to pick up on two brief things. One, he mentions unexploded munitions and mines in Syria. And I just wondered if he could expand upon that and tell us how much of that country is still, therefore, dangerous to live in for the very many people who have been forced to flee their homes. But also, I think, possibly a longer piece of work which is about rebuilding the peace and about this House and governments and how they relate to countries post-conflict. And I wondered if he could say any more about what he thinks the role is of parliamentarians across this House, across both Houses, in fact, in supporting parliamentarians and potential parliamentarians in not-quite-yet democracies in the Middle East and what role he thinks there might be for us in that peace-building. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, I, I think the, to, to, to take this two in turn, I think the first thing is, of course, the mines remain an unbelievably serious issue. They are essentially ensuring that not just a lot of agricultural land, but much of the urban centres of Fallujah, Ramadi, Mosul, and ultimately Deir and Raqqa are, are almost uninhabitable. And it's not just the question of the ordnance buried in those buildings. The old city of Mosul is so profoundly damaged that it's almost impossible to understand what you could do to rebuild these things without ceilings falling in on people's heads. And it's got literally many billions of pounds worth of damage. Uh, which brings us to the question of the role that parliamentarians can play. Actually, there is a role parliamentarians can play. Uh, there is a very gloomy analysis of countries like Iraq, which would have suggested 10 or 12 years ago that there was nothing much we could do. It is very striking that a new generation of leadership is now emerging. Uh, the visit, recent visit of the president of Iraq, Badam Saleh, uh, shows the emergence of a new a more progressive politics in Iraq, a type of politics that wishes to engage with members of parliament. That doesn't mean in Iraq or in Myanmar or indeed anywhere that we hold in this house the panacea for that. But I think respectful relationships, partnership, modelling ways of behaviour and indeed exchanging thoughts with humility about the problems we have even in this place, dealing, as the Honourable Member pointed out, with sectarian conflict in Britain or indeed dealing with some of the polarising and divisive effects of a uh, a recent referendum here may be useful in dealing with questions of the aftermath of a referendum in Kurdistan. I do apologise for having overlooked the Honourable Gentleman for Dudley South. The problem is that he's sitting in the blind spot, that when the Secretary of State is standing at the dispatch box, I can't see the Honourable Gentleman for Dudley South or anyone sitting in that seat. Um, no, 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 this is no... This is, this is no criticism of the stature of the Secretary of State. Far from it. It is just that I happen to be of considerably diminutive stature and I can't see over. And the Honourable Gentleman sits in what might appear to be a prominent position um, if one were sitting somewhere else, but not when one is sitting in the chair. Mr Mike Wood. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I quite understand that it must be my svelte figure that uh, <laughs> obviously hides me from view. Uh, following large territorial losses in 2017 and 2018, Daesh declared a global battle of attrition in May of this year. What steps is the international coalition taking to make sure that foreign terrorist fighters do not simply move their fighting elsewhere other than Syria and Iraq? Well, the, the Honourable Member has put his finger on the problem because, of course, ISIS affiliates are now emerging all the way from uh, northern Nigeria to the Philippines, and they're feeding, in every case, on very similar problems. Uh, lack of legitimacy of the local governments, corruption, poor provision of public services, sectarian and tribal conflicts, economic problems problems particularly of unemployment amongst young men, fluid borders, and in certain cases even catastrophes of climate and the environment when you look at northeast Chad. So addressing the root causes which allow this type of insurgent group to flourish involves an enormous development effort, but a development effort where currently we are about $2.3 trillion a year short of being able to provide the sort of support that could transform the economies all the way from northern Nigeria to the Philippines. So what we can do is try to balance our investment with that of other partners in a modest and targeted way. We are now looking much more closely in the work that we can do with the French and the United States on the border between Nigeria, Chad, Mali and Niger. But it remains the case, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we may have to accept that we cannot control all of the world all of the time, which is why I believe nimbleness, deep country knowledge, enormous flexibility and enormous energy is going to be required to deal with this over the next 30 to 40 years. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The, uh, welcome to the Secretary of State's uh, statement as well and thank him for his comprehensive report. The defeat of Daesh in Syria is good news. However, there has been indications that Daesh are re-establishing in other countries, for, ex for example, Afghanistan, Nigeria, Algeria, Libya. The recent story in the media that stolen U.S. missiles are in the hands of terrorists in Libya is particularly worrying. Uh, Minister, you have rightly said that contact and cooperation with other countries is now necessary. So just how will that be done 
in Libya, where it's not sure who is in charge, in northern Nigeria, where Daesh are free to roam, in Afghanistan, where, um, <coughs> they, where Daesh are, are attempting to connect in an area that they once had influence. Minister, to prevent Daesh Mark II being established elsewhere is so important. Well, so, so the, the Honourable Member has put, it, put his finger on the problem, which is that coming up with a comprehensive counterinsurgency strategy simultaneously in, in Libya, Afghanistan and Nigeria uh, is beyond us. And, I mean, at the height of the counterinsurgency surge in Afghanistan, there were not only over 100,000 troops on the ground, there were over 100,000 international civilians and $100 billion a year of expenditure, largely from the US. Those days have now passed, so we're having to respond to those conflicts with a much, much lighter footprint. And the reality is the areas where the Islamic State has established itself in those three countries are almost entirely outside government control. They're areas which not only you or I would be unable to visit, but soldiers or police from the central capitals would be unable to access. So security has to come first, but that security itself needs to be based on some kind of trust in the regime in the centre. And it is this problem that is going to be the real problem going forward. In some ways, ironically, uh, it may turn out to be an exception that Daesh tried to hold territory in Syria and Iraq. It made them ultimately an easier target. They're actually... Ultimately, their flaw was their attempt to try to hold Deir ez-Zor, Raqqa, Mosul, which in the end, with huge courage from Kurdish-led Syrian forces from the Iraqi army, allowed them to retake those areas. But when they're acting as an insurgent guerrilla group in remote areas of Afghanistan, or indeed in Nigeria, uh, or in fact in Libya, you're posing huge demands on governments that aren't actually be able to provide the intelligence the governance or the public services in those areas at all, which is going to involve a very, very different strategy, where we're not going to be able to prevent these things from emerging, and we're going to have to respond very, very quickly with partner governments when they do. Lloyd Russell Moore. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I refer to the register of interests in terms of my trips to northeastern Syria on behalf of the, uh, the um, Kurdish authorities uh, there. I want to ask particularly um, a question around... Um, the designation of northeastern Syria and Rojava as a zone under the Counterterrorism Act 2019. I am informed the Home Office wish to designate this and make it illegal for British citizens to enter this zone. He will know, as someone who visited post-war Afghanistan, the importance of allowing British people to visit these areas to help rebuild the countries. These were our allies, Secretary of State. These were people who helped, as you described, as, as, as the Secretary of State described, help defeat ISIS. And it would be totally self-defeating to make it illegal for British citizens to help cooperate with them in the future. Will the Secretary of State urgently have discussions with the Home Office to ensure Rojava, northeastern Syria, Kurdish-controlled Syria, whatever you wish to call it, is not in that designated list? Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the reason, of course, that the Home Office has been considering introducing this legislation is that we are looking at ways to try to prevent people going out for terrorist activity. This is not primarily intended to prevent humanitarian assistance going out. One of the legal issues that the Home Office has faced is that despite having very, very clearly advised that British citizens should not have been travelling to these areas in order to prevent them joining Daesh, we did not have the legal framework in place to make that happen. So the proposals that the Home Office has been looking at have been about proposals designed to target foreign fighters and to exclude people going there for humanitarian reasons. However, I hear very carefully and listening to the concerns which have also been expressed by a number of international aid agencies, NGOs and others about the possibility that people going there for uh, good reasons could be caught up with people going there for bad reasons. And I'm sure the Home Office will have heard that representation. Indeed, we as DFID have raised similar concerns ourselves. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State's analysis of the situation was thorough and highlighted in particular the fluid and unstable situation that continues to persist in this region. And, uh, but I can't help but note the cognitive dissonance that seems to exist between his department and the Home Office, particularly in relation to asylum applications from those regions. And particularly my constituents, uh, some 250 are liable to be evicted from their homes, many of whom are Syrians from this region, 
Would the Secretary of State undertake to write to his counterpart in the Home Office to emphasise the continuing and ongoing danger that this, this region presents and that there should be sufficient credence given to those asylum seeker applications so they aren't placed in a situation where their lives are threatened? Well, on this, I would say that the Home Office is trying to do a very, very difficult job, and they're often doing it very well. I mean, it is the responsibility of the Home Office to try to have a fair and transparent process for asylum seekers. It is extremely important to make sure when we are processing asylum seekers, even asylum seekers from very, very difficult countries like Syria, Iraq or Afghanistan, to make sure that we really verify those stories and make sure that people have legitimate cause to seek asylum. I'm sure the Home Office has heard carefully the point that the Honourable Member has made and will be looking carefully at these cases. But in my experience, the Home Office takes enormous care and thought in processing that, both in terms of using people who have deep country knowledge of those areas, using people who speak those local languages, in order to ensure that the support the British Government provides for asylum seekers is genuinely targeted towards the people in most need. I thank the Secretary of State for his answers.